So why don't we get started with this uh, workshop? So welcome to Stormwater Awareness Week. This is a two-part presentation. Mike had so much to talk about. He talked us into giving him a second hour. And uh, it's called BMP Kick the Can. Mike, why, why do you call it Kick the Can? Well, we decided to call it Kick the Can because it's easy to, uh, you know, read read text and even hear someone talk about, go to a class, hear someone talk about BMPs. But when you get in the field and you actually see what they are, and we call it Kick the Can because it's kind of a hands-on, um, you know, boots on the ground. What does it actually look like in the field? Uh, how are they implemented? Are they effective? Are they not effective? And so that's where we came up with the idea of Kick the Can. Bring you bring you guys with us. Right, right. And uh, before the pandemic, we actually held this class at our construction sandbox. And we have a simulated construction site here at uh, WGR's Lodi office. And we would get people out there and actually literally kick, well, maybe not the can, but the straw wattle, right? Yeah, yeah. We would and actually it, kick the BMPs. Yeah, if it goes flying up in the air, we know we have a problem. So uh, Mike had to do that uh, virtually this time. And so we have some video clips here. But uh, Mike, you, you're a QSP and your your underlying credential is SESWI. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing QSP inspections for how long? Well, I've been with the company 10 years. I've been doing them for about eight. Yeah, yeah. And, and before that, tell uh, folks a little bit about your professional background. Well, for almost just under 30 years, I was in construction and floor covering construction, worked in the Bay Area, worked in Sacramento. And so um, that gave me a lot of opportunity to actually know about BMPs because we had to implement them on sites. I didn't actually know why. We were just told that we had to, so we did. And so when I got into to, um, this trade, then it was... Um, very interesting. I'm like, oh, we, we've used those things in the past. I just didn't know what they were or what purpose they were or if they were effective or not effective. We just knew that we were forced to have to do them. So I've had a history of construction background, which makes my job actually a lot easier because I have um, been in the office in management. And so I have really through the years either been a foreman or been in management and know how to uh, relate to contractors and so it's easier for me to go out on a job site and have a conversation. It, uh, don't don't feel intimidated. Uh, pretty easy to talk. <laughs> and it gives you a little bit of an unfair advantage because uh, you've you've not only seen but you probably have done most of the tricks in the book. Yeah, I know a lot of workarounds, <laughs> and so when I see them, I just look at them and shake my head. And usually they realize, uh oh, this guy is uh, smarter than we gave him credit for. Yeah. Yeah, or he knows he knows how we do things. So, all right. Yeah. Well, with that said, let's jump into um, looking at some BMPs today. And so, what we're going to do is show some video clips from real life job sites. Now, we're going to keep the job sites as anonymous as possible. And if you recognize a job site, uh, just don't put that in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Mum's the word. We're going to keep the uh, guilty or 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 the good performers a little bit anonymous during this, but this is to illustrate um, what things look like actually out in the field. And then Mike's going to be sharing from a QSP perspective um, uh, different observations that he has. So, uh, all right. Well, let's start with the first video. And before we start this, Mike, what what do you what are we going to see? Okay, this particular site is a site that uh, we've been uh, monitoring for several years and it's a, a massive site and they do construction all over the place. Um, so this is an area that we have been to many times in the past, but as of the last 30, 45 days have not been down to. So this kind of shows you the client here uh, does really a great job. They're really proactive, but this shows you uh, mostly what would, what I try to point out is that everything requires maintenance. So you just can't uh, put it in, even if you install it correctly and walk away from it. So that's kind of what this videos are about. All right, so let's play this. Well, here we are again. It seems like time flies. It's another uh, stormwater awareness week. And um, so we're out in the field. We're gonna show you some good BMPs and some uh, BMPs that need some maintenance. 
So first I think we're going to talk about fiber roll. My name is Mike with WGR and thanks for joining us. So as we kind of look in the background here, we see a you know, fiber roll that's been put down um, and then of course it's just been a period of time. If you look down through here, some of the fiber roll is starting to decay. Uh, we notice that, you know, it's just not uh, good for the long haul. Looks like this has got some sediment built up in it and it's staked correctly and it's put in the ground fine. Oops, sorry. But then when you look at this uh, hillside, it's not really that conducive for uh, growth, for vegetation. They've got it staked correctly. They've got it uh, slope protection like it's supposed to be. It looks like some of it is just from wind and rain, uh, possibly just come apart and come down. And so you really need to consider when you're doing this is that, you know, we could come out here as a QSP and look originally and say, hey, yeah, this looks really good. They've got it hydro seeded. They've got it staked and sprayed. But we always have to go back to the fact that maintenance is always required. We can't really put a BMP down and just walk away from it. So this is kind of an example of what happens when you just walk away from it. And this has been on this site for a couple of years and the BMPs have been changed a couple of times, but you can still see that they still require maintenance. And one of the things that we have seen um, is the, you know, of course, the use of biodegradable uh, instead of the plastic wrap in the straw waddle or the fiber roll. The biodegradable can just be left because it just uh, disintegrates in time, it uh, degrades, and then all you have is straw, which can you know, not do any real harm to the environment. So that's kind of what we wanted to talk about so you can uh, see that things are, are done correctly, and, um, but they just require maintenance. So that's what we wanted to show you, kind of a kick the can, what it looked like. You know, when we first came out here, uh, the site was you know, all nice and put together and hydro seeded and really looked first rate. But like I say, it's the biggest thing for us that we know in the long term is maintenance. It is you always have to consider coming back and having a look at your product and seeing if it wears out. And like this product down through here would probably need, just need to be replaced. Uh, it's been keyed in, but just over time, it's just disintegrated. So this is what you end up looking at. And over time, what ends up happening is that this plastic just disintegrates and, and kind of becomes these little plastic nurdles, as I've heard them called in the past. And uh, then that, you know, creates another um, problem with, with discharge. So we don't want to have, uh, you know, plastic all over the environment. So, all right, then we're going to move on to uh, another product. All right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, all BMPs need maintenance. Uh, and uh, that, that uh, monofilament netting uh, in many places, by Caltrans even, is being, uh, it's not allowed because it becomes trash. Yeah, I'm seeing and, more and more of the biodegradable um, fiber roll out there than you know used to. This is all we ever saw. And I'm seeing a lot, a lot of job sites um, that sometimes you wouldn't even anticipate the residential job sites um, because of, of uh, you know, the additional costs. But I'm seeing a lot of it because in the long run, they know they can, they can walk away from this and it'll just deteriorate. But that doesn't mean that biodegradable doesn't need maintenance, uh, at least, especially during the life of the project, because uh, it, it will also become flat if the project goes long enough or torn apart either by rodents or by pieces of equipment, and it needs to be maintained. So Mike, uh, when it comes to fiber roll, what are some things that we're inspecting for regarding if it needs maintenance or not? Well, usually is the, um, you know, is there any degrading happening? Is the, you know, the staking properly? Was it um, keyed in correctly? And has there been sediment buildup? And Probably that's a lot of the times I'm looking for is there sediment buildup. And if there is, then that the biggest part of the maintenance there sometimes can just be the removal of sediment. But I, I'm looking for the integrity of the product. And, um, you know, I've seen an experience where, like I said in this video, uh, it was installed properly, it was keyed in, they had a trencher out there and they put it in. Well, but here we are again. Just over Sorry. time, you can see what happens. Yeah, wow. the sediment buildup is, is a real key to. Uh, 
to inspecting these. And basically we say that once it gets to be about one third full, uh, the, um, it needs maintenance. Yeah, without a doubt. Usually if it's keyed in correctly on an eight inch roll, you have about five inches of, of product that's, that's um, effective. So it can, it just depends on what, you know, if, especially like a job like this that has slopes, sediment buildup can be pretty quick. Um, it varies on flat slopes, but yeah, that's one thing we always look at. And I try to kind of kick the fiber roll as I go to see if it's, if it's maintaining its integrity. And, and that brings up a good point because lots of times in our trainings, we'll, we'll tease folks and call this BMP a uh, miracle roll, right? In that it's, uh, it's what a lot, of, a lot of contractors or installers, you know, consider you just fling it out on the ground and you say, do your thing. And, and it miraculously cleans up water, at least that's a perception. But we've noted some things when it's not improperly when it's not properly installed, and by that I, you were talking about that it's got to be keyed in, and staked down. How often? Every four feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's got to overlap on the ends. In fact, if you look at the screen right now, down at the base of the screen to the I guess that would be the our our right of Mike standing there. You see uh, two joined it up, right? In fact, you can even see daylight between those. That's not an appropriately installed uh, BMP. They got to overlap by uh, one to two feet and be staked down. Uh, but uh, if it's not properly installed, we've actually seen fiber roll become a liability. And um, the, uh, uh, the reason being is that fiber rolls, unlike compost socks that we may be talking about later, they don't filter water. They hold water. They act as little dams. And when the head pressure builds up behind them of uh, water, standing water, uh, it creates pressure and then it starts blowing sediment out underneath the fiber roll. And we've tested many times that the, the water quality is actually worse downstream of it when it's not installed correctly. So, all right, you ready to go on to the next clip, Mike? Sure, we can go to the okay. next one, you bet. What's, well, here we are again. So uh, you wanna introduce this one? Sure. This is uh, me talking about um, erosion control. And so this shows basically, you know, one, one road that has no erosion control and another one that has erosion control. And yet um, always the same thing that we reiterate is maintenance. So that's okay. what this is talking about. All right, let's watch this. Okay, welcome back. All right, well, I wanna talk about another erosion control. We showed you the slopes down there with the sediment controls, which were on the slopes. The erosion control would be more hydroseed, rock, asphalt, uh, straw, temporary BMPs versus permanent BMPs. Here's an example. Um, this road, a construction road is rocked all the way down, which is great for capturing sediment. And of course, the more you drive on it, the more rock needs to be kind of put back on it or, or freshened up. And versus here's another construction road that just is soil. So this is just a perfect example of where it looks like it's cut right down here. It's where sediment can just flow down through here and then impact all this great uh, BMPs that they have down road. So this is an example of um, a good sediment control would be they covered the exposed soil with rock and I believe that they're gonna eventually cover this with rock just as they get it. Um, you can look at all the hillside and these hillsides, they've been sprayed for the last couple of years and they're really, uh, they're small growth, but it's growth just the same. So we don't have a, a major amount of sediment coming down. Although this dirt road that we're talking about, that we're looking at, it will bring a lot of sediment down and make a big impact on this road. All right, so we're gonna go capture something else. Okay, so. That's a great example of two, two rows, types of rows we see on construction sites. One, we would call this a TC2, Stabilized Construction Roadway. And the one that you see on your left uh, over Mike's shoulder with a rock, it would be a, a good example of Stabilized Construction Roadway. Uh, the other one though, maybe is quite typical of many construction roadways and that is just dirt and many times going uphill. Now, 
when Mike, when when you're not ready to put the rock in, uh, what are some of the things that we can do to prevent erosion from occurring, or at least the extent of erosion to happen on a road like we see on your right there, going uphill? So water's going to flow down that. But there's certain things we can do to that roadway. One of the sure one of the things that we suggest to this client that they do most of the time. Um, is that we put water bars in, which are, are the same thing as a speed bump, as it were, because ultimately for um, erosion and for sediment coming downhill, we want to slow the flow. We want to slow the flow and we want to have it drop out as much as possible, or we want to redirect the flow off of the sediment road, as it were, into the areas that have um, even slight vegetation is better than, than nothing. So check dams, um, we could cover it temporarily with uh, some straw. It just depends on, you know, this road's a pretty good angle. So a temporary BMP like straw might not be as effective long term, but it would definitely be effective uh, for the raindrops hitting and not um, making sediment maybe lose um, the place that it is and start flowing downhill. So, but trying to redirect, we use water bars a lot because they're an easy way. We see uh, job sites where they have just gone through an excavated uh, big slope. So we'll have them um, put these cut backs in and kind of make tiers down through the slope so that uh, we can just slow the flow. Because mostly that's what we're interested in is not having this torrent come down this roadside and really make this other BMP completely ineffective. Right, so a water bar might be something like this where we put it diagonally across the roadway and um, the idea is, is as water flows down it, it hits this diagonal speed bump, basically. And, and that can be made out of different things. It can be even the dirt itself. It can be rock. Um, it can be gravel bags. There, there's different things we can use for that. Now, if we're running a lot of heavy equipment over that, we probably want it to be actually dirt. And then you'll notice that there is a little bit of a swale right here. We'd probably want to improve the swale, maybe even stabilize the swale and put check dams in the swale to walk the flow down in a controlled manner. That way this swale is stabilized. It's receiving flow between these uh, uh, water bars and it's being directed off to the side and it's coming down the hill in a stabilized manner. If we don't, if we don't put the water bars in there, Mike, after after some some a good portion of the wet season, what's that road going to look like? Well, it's going to be a soupy swamp, is what it's going to be like. Um, there's a lot of clays in the soil, and mm -hmm. and uh, probably after three quarters of an inch to an inch, every time you take a step on that road, you build up about half an inch of clay on your boots, so it becomes a big mess. So we 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 recognize. Um, the soil type and we recognize uh, what effect it has because we've been there for a time and uh, so we know that putting these water bars in and and doing any kind of temporary um, check dam to be able to slow the flow is very advantageous uh, for the project. Yeah yeah good we got a question here something to convey the concentrated flows from the first bar uh, drawn by John yeah yeah, uh, Walter, good good comment. So um, let me get my annotating tools back up here. I shouldn't have turned turned them off yet. So so yeah, if we have a water bar here, and let's say another one here, and uh, basically we have water coming down the hill. So let me uh, maybe um, get a different tool here. I don't want to get too fancy, but we have water coming down the hill. We're going to deflect it off into this swale right here. Now, this swale has the makings of a swale. It's not ready yet. We need to apply some more BMPs. And so uh, we would follow the Casco or the Caltrans uh, BMP on stabilized swales, which would call for most likely putting a geotextile or jute mesh lining that. And then putting check dams in there basically to walk the flow down the hill. And the spacing of the check dams is so that the bottom of the upper check, check dam up, uh, to, up uh, above on the hill is at the same elevation as the top of the lower check dam. And so we're basically walking them down, down that uh, swale in a stabilized way. 
And then, of course, once we get to the bottom of the hill, and this might not be the best example to show that, we would want to then um, stabilize where the water's going. If it's going into a drain inlet, we'd want some velocity dissipation devices, maybe some more uh, DI protection in that case, depending where it's where it's headed. Yeah, and there are two swales here. So we got a swale up here and a swale over here. Um, it's hard to tell from the picture what's happening, uh, which way the road is graded. To me, it looks like it's headed more towards Mike, but uh, um, that would be the idea. Anyways, let's move on. And good, good comments, good questions, everybody. Let me clear those drawings and uh, let's go to our next. All right, so Mike, what are you going to talk about here? Well, we're going to put, talk about the notorious portable toilets and where they are and, uh, and how to be able to, you know, uh, take care of them so where they don't get knocked over or damaged uh, to be able to uh, keep as much concentrated flow in the facility instead of outside of it. All right, let's watch hey, this. Mike with WGR back again. All right, what we're talking about right now is that you can see is uh, portable toilets. Portable toilets seem to be one of those things that, you know, uh, the permit requires that they be in secondary containment or that they be at least 50 feet from the storm drain. This particular place, um, these porta potties don't have a secondary containment, but what they do have is they've been staked down. As you can see, they've been tied down so they're not going anywhere in wind or if somebody happened to bump them. So this is a great way to do it. Uh, one of the things that we've seen on Caltrans sites is they require things be staked down. But on some construction sites, we don't see it as often. But just so that you know that on the portable toilets, this is what we always recommend is that they stake them down because you don't know how crazy wind uh, can get or if they get you know bumped into by a piece of equipment. So um, there you go. Well, kind of what I wanted to do is refresh a bit because um, I think that we want to talk about in the BMP world, if we look at everything that we've seen so far and you were to say, oh, that's bad, that all needs to be done. The, the actual owner of the property is doing very well. They are, they are really proactive in uh, replacing BMPs as soon as we bring it to their attention, they replace BMPs. And so when we go down into an area that we haven't seen in a while because there's nothing active going on there and it's the dry season, of course with the dry season, a lot of people, you know, get pushed back about, well, it's dry, you know, what do I have to do besides, you know, concern myself about dust control. So we always try to talk to, to our customers about why don't you be proactive during the summertime leading up to the rain because we don't want to, you know, stumble on a storm starting to happen and your BMPs are all a mess. It's easier to fix them when it's dry and to be able to, uh, you know, rush out and be reactive. It's nice to be proactive for a change. So they have nice sediment controls, which is always a plus, but a lot of times we get on uh, subdivisions. This isn't a subdivision, it's an industrial site. Uh, it's not actually an industrial site, it's just a big construction site. So, um, you know, they're doing a really good job. They've got a lot of equipment moving, a lot of product, and so them graveling roads as they go is really uh, lessening their impact as far as sediment um, transfers, and so we really appreciate that. And just like I say, it's one of those things that what we want to do when storm season rolls around or prior to storm season is take a good look at all the BMPs on site and talk to them about what maintenance is required, uh, maybe sediment needs to be removed, maybe some more check dams to be put in, that kind of thing. So we always like to see uh, good BMPs in place before the storm season comes because if we have some of these crazy rains, not like the last couple of years, but we could have some, then we want all this stuff to be effective. And we want our clients to be uh, compliant. So anyway, there you go. So that's Mike signing off at WGR and we'll see you on the next one. Okay, so let's talk porta potties for a moment. Now, uh, I know here we've often um, we've often debated the value of containment under uh, porta potties, uh, especially those containment trays. What we've often pointed out in our demonstrations, uh, field demonstrations, and in our QSP QSD classes, is you know when does that containment tray fill up? Yeah, when it rains. Yeah, first storm, right? It's yeah. full and it stays full usually for the rest of the season. Right. So what kind of containment is that? You know, we've often laughed about that and kind of you know wondered, scratched our heads about that. 
course, if you're doing a job for Caltrans, you don't have a choice. They want containment. They have to have containment. If, in fact, uh, next next workshop is stormwater Caltrans style, and I definitely recommend uh, attending that. Um, but they have their own specifications, their own standards, their own uh, the the things they're looking for. And if they saw these porta potties on a Caltrans job, that would be inadequate. It, you would be written up in in the inspection report or in in the CCEP inspection. So um, what Mike mentioned in the videos, the, the main thing we want to see is that it's not right next to a drain inlet. And uh, um, where, where typically do you see porta potties placed, Mike? Well, they'll be, they'll be everywhere. It depends. Uh, construction sites, usually a residential. I've seen them in the street. Um, probably the majority of time they're on soil of some sort. I've seen them on sidewalks. They're located in different places. Sometimes it's just where the uh, company sets them. Uh, it's not necessarily the contractor placing them. It's usually the, the company that's uh, handling the maintenance puts them someplace that's ease of accessibility. And a lot of times if we see them any place like, uh, you know, close to a storm drain or on a sidewalk or uh, any place like that, I'm usually going right to the contractor to talk to him about, you know, putting those in a, a safer place for sure. Um, staking them down is really key in a lot of instances. I see, I think the real plus that I found in the past is that I guess years ago, the, um, what they used in the porta potties was formaldehyde. And now that is a thing of the past. So sometimes I would see the blue stuff on the ground and, and you would think about, you know, what kind of a discharge is this? And so I pursued that once and found out that it, um, they don't deem it as hazardous unless of course it's the porta potty dumped over and it's you know something out of that um, and then you got bacteria and fecal coliform and yeah, uh, stormwater mess. pollutants that are definitely of a concern we got some uh comments uh yeah. walter's absolutely right communication with the subs is key in fact uh, that that is you can't underscore that enough because the general is usually the one contracting with the qsp or qsd or even has the qsp on staff uh, they're the ones who paid to have the SWIP developed many times, but oftentimes those subs who aren't on the site every day, they haven't been trained. So making sure they know where to put the porta potty is really important. No, that's very true. The, I, I think probably the most frustrating thing that, that I run into frustration from the contractor's point of view is the fact that why don't these guys know, um, you know, know understand these BMPs and know how to take care of them. So there's always, there's retraining every time. And when I see someone doing something as a subcontractor, I just go up and talk to them and uh, sell, tell them that, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're not aware of this, but these are the rules and this is what you have to do. And this is how it needs to be maintained so that they can't claim ignorance. Right, right. And Carrie brings up a good point. Is there a requirement for staking the porta potties? Or you could even uh, build on that uh, question about even where you place it. And the truth of the matter is, no, the, the construction general permit actually says very little about the, um, let's see, we must have some background noise there. The construction general permit actually says very little about where porta bodies are placed other than they need to be containment, they need to be secured. It gets very little detail, but here's where the requirement comes in is, what standard are you using? It, if as a SWIP writer, I write uh, and I incorporate in the CASCA standard, then the CASCA standard has very specific language about how far away should it be placed, how should it be secured, and, and how we use that. So if I'm bringing that in by reference, which I would say 90% of the SWIP writers do, um, then, then once I bring that in as, as my standard, that is my requirement. I got to follow that because that is what the SWIP has committed to. Um, if you're doing a Caltrans job, then you have no choice. You got to follow this Caltrans standard. And it definitely also has many of the same requirements that are in the CASCA requirement uh, uh, standard as well. So, all right, let's, uh, let's move on to the next one, Mike. Okay. okay. And uh, let's see. Welcome back. I'm Mike with WGR. We're there doing we another storm.
Stormwater Awareness Week. And so we thought we'd take you into the field and basically we talk about kicking the can, what things actually look like on site versus us just talking about them. So we look at this fiber roll. This is a used as a perimeter control, but it's also a sediment control. Um, it's supposed to be keyed in every four feet. Looks like there might have been a stake here, but now it's missing. And so it was a, a slight trench here, and it looks like it's pretty well keyed in all the way. So this is a great example, uh, or this is a good example of what a sediment control uh, should be in place and then what it should look like. It needs to be keyed in for sure. A lot of times we talk about fiber roll and in uh, some situations where I go on site, I think um, they have more faith in their fiber roll than, than uh, maybe the manufacturers because they just roll it out. It might lay on top of the sidewalk. Uh, it may be in a unique place. In fact, I've seen it at, at the, on the top of a, of a flat area where they think the water's gonna run uphill. So that's interesting. So anyway, so I wanted to talk about the the fiber roll for sure. And then we just can kind of walk over here and look at the silt fence. Now the silt fence is another perimeter control, but it's also a sediment control. So it can be used as both. And the reason that we like silt fence is because of the height. So this stuff keyed in, as you can see, it's underground. So it's got soil on both sides of it and it's keyed in. Well, it's got at least two feet of sediment that it can catch before it, um, you know, overflows or has a as a as a detrimental impact plus the best thing to do so as you look at the silt fence down through here just the wind and things that are just happening in the area there's always maintenance that needs to be done so it needs to be retacked so in my report i would put silt fence installed properly but needs repair i would take a picture and point that out where it needs some repair also after a couple of rain events and you get some sediment build up the best thing to do is to come on the back side of the silt fence and remove the sediment. Now, as you'll notice, the stakes where they are on the silt fence are in the right position. I have seen them in the other way, but if you have the um, water flowing toward the stake, then it's gonna rip the silt fence down and knock it down and it's gonna be completely ineffective. So um, anyway, so here's some silt fence and they need some repair on it, but it's keyed in correctly, which is a real plus because sometimes it's just staked in laying on top of the ground. So you always need to come by and you know give it a kick, give it a tug, just make sure that it's keyed in correctly. And if it's not, bring it to the contractor's attention. Okay. All right, we're gonna move on to the next BMP. All right, great. Let's um I want to back this one up, and there's something I noticed here. Let's take it back here. I want to get a good picture of where is he downhill? Right there. All right. So Mike did point out that uh, for the most part, this is a pretty good installation, but does anyone see a big problem though uh, with, with how water's gonna flow at this site and how the perimeter controls are situated? You can either put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you would like. Anybody see a big, a big change? In fact, I'm gonna open up my annotating tool again. Needs gravel bag check dams. Yes, Ed, Edward, yes. That's exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, notice how at least the, this appears to be going downhill. And Mike, am I correct in my perception? Sometimes pictures yes. can be a little deceptive. No, it's going downhill. So it's going downhill. Where is water gonna flow? Water's gonna flow like this, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to flow that way. Where are we going to get our rills? Right here, right here. Uh, basically, it's going to flow. It's going to hit the fiber roll, and it's going to flow downhill. And so Edward is absolutely right in what we need to do. We need to basically create some, some checks. And there's different ways you can do that. Uh, he suggested using gravel bags, and that would be a fine way to do it. Um, one of the ways I actually like to do is when we're doing the fiber roll here, notice that it terminates right here, right here where I'm drawing. What I would do is basically if that was the end of my fiber roll, here's my fiber roll, I'm running it here. I would bend it like that and then terminate there and then overlap my next one and pick it up 
and head down and, and bend it back up like this. That way as water flows, it's hitting my checks and I'm not, I'm using one, one BMP. I'm using the fiber roll both as the perimeter control and, and as a check. Now, another option might be in this particular situation, uh, and it kind of depends, it's hard to tell from this picture what's actually happening. I, I believe it's probably is headed uh, ultimately towards the sidewalk. You could do a curb cutback, might work really good for this perimeter. And what do we mean by a curb cutback, Mike? Well, actually that's what is done there. That wasn't um, a curb cutback, just means that you're gonna reduce the soil next to a hardscape by four to six inches. And then, mm -hmm. you know, water doesn't care what it hits. It's not going to go over it. In this situation, it was a pretty good slope, so it might creep over it slowly, but it's the same thing. It's a great BMP and you could put uh, check dams um, so like John says. So do a curb cutback along the sidewalk. And then mm -hmm. instead of running your fiber roll this direction, run it this direction across. And that might be a really good way to uh, address that. And and uh, the same thing with the, with the silk fence, the same idea is happening on that side too. So you mm -hmm. definitely would want to provide checks on that side. And if you go to the CASCA or the Caltrans um, standards as the, the BMP fact sheets, they talk about that and they actually give some drawings on how to do that. Uh, good question here. Um, yeah, good observation. Waddles aren't overlapped. Um, and what would be the most cost effective way to address this? Uh, that's, a, that's a tough one. I, I personally think that, um, using the fiber rolls to do both would probably, in my mind, be more cost effective. Um, it, it probably though boils down to how much we're actually installing. Um, it could reach a point where it's cheaper to buy uh, gravel bag berms and have your crews just lay them down. Because if you think about it, every time you angle it, you're having to cut a little trench in. And at some point that probably becomes more expensive and labor intensive than just laying down gravel bag checks. So good question, good comment. And let's see, here's another one. Also, if check dams are in the way, then bags may be easier than fiber roll. Yeah, yeah, good, good thing. That, that is a, that's a really good point is when you're selecting your perimeter control, be thinking about how permanent or how temporary it needs to be if you occasionally need to move in or move out a piece of equipment, it's really hard to do it with silt fence or fiber roll that's properly installed. And so it's a lot easier with gravel bags or compost socks or curb cut back to do that. So those are, that's a very good, good observation. Yeah, and gravel bags can be reused where it's really difficult to, to reuse um, uh, uh, fiber rolls. All right, just check, doing a time check here. All right, let's uh, clear that drawing. And uh, I think we got at least one more. Let's, uh, let's move on. Let's see, there we go. I think we're gonna talk about track out this time. Mike, uh, any, any opening thoughts here? Yeah, um, I, want, I want to talk about track out. I mean, we've seen, you know, poor track out and we know what TC1 is and TC2. So um, this basically is just talking about uh, TC1 and what's implemented there, is it implemented correctly? And then what do we anticipate? Because when we look at, at good BMPs, especially uh, not impacted with sediment and nice and clean and, and ready to go, we can think they're just uh, really super effective. But this kind of shows you um, a different view. Okay, and in this this time, we're actually uh, showing you a clip from our construction sandbox, which is a simulated uh, construction site that we use for teaching purposes. And in this, you'll see BMPs that are compliant and BMPs that are definitely not compliant, uh, like the stockpile right behind Mike. That obviously needs something. Uh, but uh, let's take a look at this. All right, welcome back. Mike with WGR again. We're going to talk about a few things. We've got about three more topics to cover. One of the things I wanted to discuss is we've kind of seen some track out that uh, you know required maintenance. 
I wanted to talk about this truck out. And according to TC1, we're relatively, because of the size of the space, pretty close to what they recommend. This is a foot deep. It's got a three to five rock on it. It's got fabric underneath the rock. We've got a rumble grate in. And we don't have exactly 50 feet. We've got about, uh, about 38 feet, but it should be pretty effective. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drive a vehicle through and we're gonna really get an idea of what we all think is that if this kind of track out is in place, then it's pretty beneficial. So I want you guys to have a look. big rock and a rattle trap and some more rock that we would have a pretty good um, system here and we wouldn't have any track out. But as you can see, the evidence is clear is there's still a little bit of tracking. And as you turn and kind of look towards the vehicle, you can still see uh, a little bit of tracking too as well, which really speaks to the fact that with any BMP, there's always maintenance required. So is any BMP completely effective? And the answer is no that there needs to be a sweeping program in place and you need to have make sure that you uh, track with how this is going and you need maintenance on this. Maybe you need to fluff up the rock. Um, anyway, if sediment builds up in the rattle trap, you need to clean the sediment up. But anyway, all right, well, that's the uh, track out for us. So now we'll go to our next one. Okay, great. Let me back up here a little bit and um, let's take a look at, at uh, this. Yeah, well, let's see. I wanted to see the clean out All right there. All right, so first first comment about this, uh, when we first put this in, you know, we spent some dollars uh, putting this in a fake construction site. And what we learned is when it's installed correctly, you're looking at probably $5,000 per controlled exit uh, for an installation. And and so that was a big lesson learned there is these aren't cheap and and it, it you know, costs a lot of money. Therefore, it, you don't want to put these on every exit. And so, Mike, if we don't want somebody going out an uncontrolled exit, what's one of the cheapest track out controls we can have? Uh, redirecting them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> redirecting them and, and not letting them just enter the site anywhere they want to and having them enter and exit as we want so that we can have something that's effective versus them just driving over the sidewalk onto the job site. Yeah, so delineators, ribbon, cones, or uh, more likely when you got uh, uh, people who aren't going to listen to any of that, K-rails, <laughs> to keep <laughs> them from, from going out where they should not be going out. That can save you a lot of money and save you a lot of headaches. Um, I think know, one of the things that we ahead. learned from this, John, is that this is one vehicle, the dry season, we just created a little muddy area. This is one small vehicle, uh, probably maybe two or three revolutions. I spun the tires where we could kind of get some mud on there going out. Yeah. So just think about if this all was wet and this was several vehicles, half a dozen a day or more uh, entering and exiting, you know, what would this look like? And definitely without a sweeping program, uh, it would just be completely overwhelmed. Yeah, 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 that, that's what we learned is too, you know, we spent all this money on this and we were just, I mean, almost sick. It's like, you're kidding me, one vehicle, we're still getting track out. And so that was a huge eye opener. Uh, let's talk a little bit about design, because if someone is installing this, they're going to install it to the TC1 spec, which is both Casca and Caltrans uses that same spec, uh, which is, I, is very, very similar between the two organizations. Now, the low spot on the track out, Mike, where should the low spot be? The low spot on the track out should be, um, you know, back by the 
by where the rattle trap is, where it can capture you yeah. know, most of the, the right here. And stuff right there. This should be the low spot. Mm -hmm. So flow should be coming this way or possibly the other way too is fine. Away, definitely away from the exit. Uh, and flow over here should be headed this way like this. And so usually what do we install here? So what we have done, it's kind of hard to see if you're on site, you can see it, but we have this as a low area. And what we have is we put fabric in there and then we put a bucket in there with a sump pump and we use it for dust control. We offset the water that comes out of the rain or vehicles driving across and uh, remove it back to another location to where it's uh, not impacting the exit. Yeah, and another real challenge to this type of uh, track out control is maintenance. And Mike mentioned about fluffing it. There's, it's, there's no easy way to fluff it, by the way. Uh, it is, <laughs> you're basically destroying it. Yeah, there's no easy way to fluff it. What we did in this scenario, we learned a lesson. We tried a couple of different rattle traps. This particular one has a grate that comes off the top. So the frame is in the ground. This grate comes off the top because I would talk to contractors about, well, why don't you get the sediment out of this? And they said, well, it's a backhoe, you know, probably 45 minutes to an hour of, of maintenance to get it out, get it clean. And then it's another 45 minutes to get the rock pulled back far enough to get the thing set back in. And it's just a big hassle. So we thought, well, maybe there's a better way to build a better mass trap. And so with this lid that comes off, at least they can get in there, um, scoop out the sediment and uh, dispose of it and then put the lid back on. But, but really just speaks to the fact that we realized that even the TC1 uh, in, in the best world example uh, isn't effective without, uh, you know, some other BMPs. Yeah, yeah. And um, the, another reason we want this to, the rattle trap to be uh, the low spot is because there's another good maintenance uh, technique. And I wish I could say this was my idea. I saw somebody using this and I thought it was great. They take a fire hose if they have high pressure, a high pressure hose available. And basically they'll wash this rock out into the center here where it's collected either under this rattle trap or off to the side in the sediment trap. And that way they can rejuvenate the rock without completely destroying it or disturbing it and and um, and wash that sediment into here. And, and that's why you want this to be the low spot. So you definitely you don't want to wash it to the street. So, uh, and we've seen uh, actually people get violations because their track out control are draining to the street. And that's one of the uh, biggest things that you don't want to do with a track out is have it drain towards the street. Um, so you really got to give it some thought there. All right, should we move on? Sure. Hey, welcome back, Mike with WGR. Okay, we're gonna talk about concrete washout. Well, you know, in a lot of residential homes, we see small things like kiddie pools set around because they don't have a great deal of cement. A lot of the concrete companies, they have a catch system on the back of their um, concrete chute. And they catch their, their um, excess or their slurry. But this is, you know, when we look at something like this on a job site, we think, oh, well, my problems are all solved because look at the size of this bin. One of the things that happens is when this bin gets close to full, you've got to call a company out that's going to dump it and they're going to have to dewater it because more than likely it's full of a bunch of water in the washout. And one of the things that you always have to do is kind of just have a good look around. We look inside the concrete washout and make sure that it's got plenty of room in it for if they're doing washout, uh, if they're pouring concrete. But then look down here. This looks like a little bit got spilled because to be honest with you, I've yet to be on a job and seeing the concrete company backing their truck up onto one of these washing out and not having some spillage. So if this happens, you know, the state, how they feel about this is that we're raising the pH in the groundwater. And so this is a big no-no. So you really have to pay attention, even though you see this beautiful big tub, you think, oh gosh, you know, I have it made. I don't have to do anything, no problems, but that's not necessarily the case. Remember with all BMPs, no matter how they look, they always require maintenance. Okay, well, let's go on to the next one. All right. Yeah. And uh, it was mentioned earlier, but communication with the subs is key and especially your concrete delivery people. Uh, Mike, they're notoriously bad for not following the rules. We oh, I don't know how many times that we've been. I've been on job sites where I am talking to the concrete guy. You know, he's washing his 
uh, concrete shoot out on some dirt or I've seen them wash it out in the in the gutter. Uh, and, it's, it's fascinating. And we've been living under this permit now for 13 years. And every time you talk to one of these guys, you know, and I mean, they've been in the business as long as we have. Uh, and every time you talk to them, it, it, it's like it was a new concept, like uh, they had never heard about it before. Yes, it is almost like we're speaking a foreign language and <laughs> they didn't know what we're talking about. And, oh, I get the comment, oh, I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, usually when I walk up to them and they just see you, they're already starting to panic. They're already starting to roll their hoses up. So they know what they're supposed to do. Uh, but if they can get away with not doing it, then that's exactly what they do. <laughs> right. How many projects were you at just today? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, uh, having to stay on them. Uh, in fact, if you're, if you're doing a Caltrans job, not only do you have to have uh, washout stations, but you have to have a sign. The Caltrans specification requires that there, that the area be posted as the concrete washout area so that everyone knows where it's at. Um, now, uh, there's different ways to manage your washout. You mentioned a, a, a couple in the video about uh, uh, pools. In fact, uh, uh, I don't believe Caltrans allows that. They do allow the lined boxes, the plastic lined boxes. Um, what other types of concrete waste management have you seen? Well, I've seen where they've uh, removed some soil and, and then lined it with plastic, put hay bales around, put the plastic over the hay bales. That's not a uh, great scenario sometimes because of when the concrete dries out, how are you gonna remove it without damaging the plastic? Uh, but I've seen it used. Uh, the kiddie pools I see a lot. Um, and there's always, well, um, you know, we're going to pour a sidewalk here. So just dumping it here should be no big deal. Um, yeah. It's fascinating, but I think mostly in um, residential sites, I see the kiddie pools used more than anything. Um, but I have seen on several sites, um, areas that are recessed that have plastic on the ground that have hay bales around and the plastic covering the hay bales to contain for containment. Right. And there's also the self uh, recycling uh, trucks or the trucks that are equipped with recycling capabilities. Basically, they'll have a bucket they attach to the end of their chute, and on the bottom of the bucket is a uh, vacuum hose or a hose attachment that they basically can then wash down their chute with their own water, and it's caught theoretically in the bucket and then transferred back into the mixing uh, um, part of the, of, the, of the concrete truck and then taken it back to the batch plant to be recycled with that batch plant's wastewater. That's true. I, I have seen several of those um, systems in place um, where they're capturing and they they're have a hose that goes right back into their, their truck. Um, probably more times than not, it's just the cleaning of the chute that is making more of a mess than the capture system that they have set up. Yeah, a lot of times we'll see as much water on the ground with that type of thing as we see in the bucket. All right, let's, I think you got one more, right? One more. Yeah, let's, here we go. Hello, Mike with WGR back again. Okay, this next topic we're gonna to talk about is stockpiles. And in an earlier discussion, we saw how stockpiles, um, you know, you have to always pay attention to them because wind comes up, um, rain comes up, just the degrading of the plastic. There can be several things uh, that you have to take into consideration, but as we look at this stockpile, it seems pretty good because it calls for it to be, the perimeter to be burned, and there you see it's weighted down with sandbags, so this looks pretty good. All of this is only good for so long as the sun, as we know in California, bakes this plastic. It ends up, especially with wind that we have in the valley, it ends up tearing and ripping and falling apart, so you really have to watch uh, maintenance on this. Also, one of the things that we recommend is that this looks great for an emergency situation to cover a stockpile in plastic, but you need to think about what's at the bottom of the stockpile. So with, with this, we don't have many fines here and there's not a lot of powdered sediment because tracking in and out. So, but you have to think about if I've taken this um, stockpile and I put plastic on it, then I've made a giant water slide, which is gonna affect the erosion on the ground. So a lot of times I'll recommend, depending on site surfaces, so if the site is 
vegetated around, it's not that critical to have this kind of a situation. But if it's not, if it's in the middle of a of an area that's tracked all the time and has got a lot of what we call baby powder just because of, of tracking of vehicles, then I recommend covering it with a temporary thing like straw, something that will not allow erosion and won't allow sheet flow to come off at a high rate of speed. So that's just a good thing to keep in your uh, thought process is always think about what tools do you have in your toolbox, your BMP toolbox, to be able to pull out and to be able to recommend to the contractor for them to be a success for them to be a success because if this water slide comes down and starts to erode and really takes stuff to a storm drain then you've got a bigger problem than just covering this with plastic that's mike signing off thanks all right and uh, mel's got a good comment uh the cgp requires that waste be protected from wind and rain at all times and uh, i think this is more in regards to the washout he's talking about but it can also apply to stockpiles that he requires uh, uh, in all his swips that washouts be covered overnight, mm -hmm. no matter if it's raining or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Finding lids and covers is not easy. And I would agree with you, Mel, especially if they're homeless around there like gold. <laughs> so uh, they tend to walk off our sites a lot too. Um, but uh, we actually wrote a uh, newsletter a few months ago about stockpiles. And uh, basically, we were following teaching we I had received as a trainer of record and also following the CASCA and the Caltrans cut sheets. And we talked about stockpiles needing to be covered after 14 days of inactivity. And the San Diego Regional Board reached out to me and said, oh, no, John, that's incorrect. And in fact, they, they sent me uh, links to some uh, violations that uh, they had uh, pursued that ended up in penalties and administrative uh, civil liability uh, fines. And it was because stockpiles had not been covered immediately. Uh, and so according to the regional board, the San Diego regional board, and I've confirmed this with other regional boards, that the 14 days of inactivity does not apply in their opinion to stockpiles. Now, it's kind of interesting because there's still both Caltrans and CASCA in their documentations, in, the, in their reports and in their standards um, seem to advocate something different than that. But the regional boards are not extending that 14 days of inactivity to stockpiles. To disturb soil areas, yes, but not stockpiles. So the lesson we learned is if you're not actively digging into it, they expect it to be covered and burned. We are just about out of time, but Mike, uh, any last comments here? I'm good. In fact, I'm going to stop the share so we can. See. I think that probably the takeaway that I always get from 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 do, being a QSP is this: is that we are like an umpire. We go out, we call it like balls and strikes. Uh, we, you know, I'm not necessarily out on a job site to be the stormwater police, I'm always trying to talk to the contractor and have enough of a relationship to be able to have them, um, you know, in agreement with you as much as possible. I mean, the bottom line is it stops, the buck stops with them or ultimately the LRP. But I just wanna, um, I talk to them about, okay, these BMPs have been called out for by QSD, but let's just make sure they're effective when it starts to rain. Let's just make sure they work because just because they're called out doesn't mean that they necessarily work um, as described. So that really is the key for me is that number one, I always tell them there's maintenance involved um, that you have to take care of. You can't just put something out and, and call it good for life. And um, then like I say, just um, wanting them and helping them to become compliant. That's and of right. course the pushback for most of our contractors is always dollars and cents. So I try to make it as um, palatable as possible and try to talk them through what might be the least, um, why it, may, it can be effective, but uh, is the least cost. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you for uh, putting on this kick the can workshop. This was part one. So part two is going to be at 315 and in between now and then uh, is the Caltrans workshop at 2 p.m. So. I hope uh, we can see many of you at uh, these workshops. If you miss any of them uh, or have to check out early or had technical difficulties, 
check back at the website in about 24 hours. We'll have the recorded version at the very same place you logged in for this class or any of the classes. So thank you again, everyone. And we'll thank see you, you at the next workshop.